Welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Felicity from Cargo Crew. From people who don't know, what does your company do? Um, so Cargo Crew is the modern uniform. So we design fashion forward, quality, contemporary uniforms that we really want staff to wear. We want people to feel good in uniform. In the kitchen, where? What, what, um, what people are their uniform? We're complete front to back offering. Okay. So um, when I first started the business, we started with four denim aprons. 22 years ago, um, I kicked off the business. So started with four denim aprons. Um, we've had a very key focus throughout the journey on hospitality, front of house. As we've continued to evolve our range and our offering, we've also now extended to chef wear um, and also more so into corporate, modern corporate, hotels, you know, full service. So basically our whole focus now is about building this global uniform destination and bringing this kind of like design-led quality focus, but making it accessible for people and businesses so that... You mean by price? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. I think from that perspective where we sit in the market, we're not the cheapest and we don't want to be. We really want to work on delivering like an affordable product, but really focused on quality and design. So we're not the highest end and we're not the cheapest. And I think that's what makes us unique because I feel that we bring the kind of like quality and the brand experience and a real actual retail experience to our offering Okay. at an affordable price. An affordable luxury. Affordable luxury, exactly. So we're really you know, excited to bring that to the US because what we've found is that our design aesthetic really resonates with the, with the US market. I think in general, the US scene and hospitality, they're very driven by that visual language and they really love to support, you know, what their staff are wearing, how that kind of supports the visual of the of the venue or of the brand that they're selling. Yeah. So I do feel like Americans have a great appreciation for quality workwear. Yeah. And for us, I think we've got a really great sweet spot of what we're wanting to build here. Okay. Um, so it's super exciting. So of all the things you could be spending your time on, so 22 years ago, yeah. what made you start this company? What did you see in the marketplace? Maybe yeah. you were in fashion before. Yeah, what, yeah how I did was. You, how did it all start? Okay, so I studied fashion at RMIT in Melbourne. After I finished my course, I worked for one year in fashion PR. So that was the only job that I ever had um, working for a boss. <laughs> did that for one year and then I started a fashion label with a girlfriend from college. We did that fashion brand for five years. We used to wholesale to small boutiques around the country, used to do like the young designer fashion parades. And people would say, you guys are doing so well, but it was like, we couldn't afford to buy a coffee. We never got paid. <laughs> so we never got paid. And yes, we got great marketing and great kind of brand profile. But the reality is it was such a hard business at such a young age. Yeah. And I think the lessons that I learned from that part of my journey was particularly going into when I started Cargo Crew was this kind of reinvestment, continuous reinvestment in the, in the business, business yeah, which is why it took so long. But the story was at that time, um, we used to get um, businesses who would approach us and say, oh, we love what you're doing. Can you design us a uniform? Mm -hmm. And so those experiences really inspired me to think this is a business in, in the itself. hospitality world. They would ask uh, Yeah, you? absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So it was mainly hospitality. And I thought this is a great business opportunity because I love marketing and I love brand and I love design. Yeah. So that was how Cargo Crew came to life. And you saw an opportunity there where it's like most, most brands, most hospitality venues are sort of missing this. They don't see yeah. it as an opportunity because they're just thinking these uniforms yeah. are going to get dirty yep. and they can wear whatever. Let's make it really cheap and things. Absolutely. They, just yeah, kind of throw away. Of so they can throw. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And yeah, I feel like at the time when we, and still very much today, um, when we entered the market, we were really about disrupting the model of what uniforms were. So at the time, the uniform industry was really controlled by big kind of wholesalers. And so they would be kind of very generic. So there was no brand attached to them. They would just have big stock holdings and all of the resellers would come and buy and just embroider and sell right. to the so customers. Right, almost like towels or something. Yeah, just yeah. very generic. Right. And, right. and so I think that, you know, from the start, our approach was we wanted to bring that direct design quality product to the market and service those customers directly and build that relationship with our customers. So basically, you know, I started off on my own and then about six years in, my sister joined me in the business and her background was advertising and creative copywriting and service. So she basically was working in London um, at the time. I'd started the business and was on my own for six years, had my children and I was working in the backyard still in a in an office that my husband had built. Wow, so mom CEO. Yeah, that's it, right? Wow. It was, it was a hustle and then my sister said I'm going to come back to Australia I'm going to come work with you let's build the business together and so the minute that she came back she was in the backyard with me in this tiny office she's like we've got to get out of here and it was actually <laughs> just when the GFC hit 
So at the time, we were like looking for a way of how we could afford to move into an office space. And one of my good friends who ran a PR agency at the time was scaling back just because of everything that had happened with the GFC. So we ended up moving in with them into this office. PR. And yeah. so we had instantly, we had colleagues and we had like other people. And it wasn't PR. just the two of us. And we had this presence because we had this beautiful office that it, it kind of elevated us straight away into being like a business that had a presence, a That's physical so presence. That's fascinating, yeah. So we did that for many years from the, um, and really at that time, the business was focused on the Melbourne market. Like we were a local business. We, we used to service a lot of big brands like L'Oreal back in the day, other kind of corporate businesses. And it was an, in around 2010 that we decided that we wanted to create a range that we could sell from stock. So prior to that time, everything was custom made. So we would do, everything was bespoke programs. So like um, literally like tailoring? Like yeah, you would correct. measure people? Okay, yeah, wow, wow. Yeah, it was okay. all custom made and it was- Very bespoke. It was very bespoke. And the thing with bespoke is it's good because you can get exactly what you envisage, but the reality is of the minimums, the reorders, the cost, it's very expensive and time consuming. And so what we decided to do around 2010, we were like, we wanna produce our own line that we hold in stock. We can sell direct to customers and that there's no minimums. Mm -hmm. And that was our philosophy. That's smart. And so then we started with the four denim aprons. And at that time, we then built an online store. And I remember at the time talking to an embroiderer of ours who we'd used for years. He used to embroider for us even back when I had the label. So I knew him very well. And he did a lot of embroidery for different uniform businesses. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, we're setting up this online store for uniforms. It's going to be like a really kind of direct fashion model. And he's like, Felicity, uniforms online doesn't work. It's not going to work. And I was like, what? Like, we'd Why already did spent you say that? I don't know. I think he just thought that like people don't, you know, understand the purchasing of a uniform online. They want to be able to have that direct interaction. Interesting. Well, so he was wrong. Clearly. He was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. And I think what's been really exciting about the journey after we launched online, we went from being a Melbourne business to a national business. And then within a th probably around three months, an international business in the sense that we used to have people email us and say they found us online, can, can they you? order? Right. And so our, I remember our first order was, our first international order was from a coffee house in Mexico. Okay. And like you should have seen, at that time there was probably around four or five of us in the business. And so we were running around the office going, oh my God, we just got this email from Mexico. And so we used to process the international orders offline. And then over the years, we built obviously international shipping and, and we now ship to over 80 countries. But what's really funny about it is if you think about the growth of the business over 22 years, starting with a very bespoke offering, moving into doing you know a small range, building on that range, and then really along that journey, also building the tech capability and the service capability of course, to yeah. be able to service customers. That's been a really big part of it. And so my husband has always been behind the scenes. You know, he built the first spreadsheet of what of how we used to take orders. But then over the years, you know, he's implemented all of the systems. So between himself and my sister and, and me, we have a very diverse kind of skill set. And I think that's been like our secret source to success as well. And then over the time, we've built an incredible team who are very ingrained in the business. They really love, I think, the quality and selling that to customers and really servicing our customers to deliver value. So it's not just the product, it's, it's the whole offering. It's the curation of how you can put together the right look for your business, understanding that. And then also within HQ in Australia, we have a full embroidery service offering. So we can also embroider and customise our, our pieces. So yeah, it's been an incredible journey. And the website has just given us a window to the world. Was it always called Cargo Crew? No, so at the start, we've been through a couple of name transitions. Say, yeah, yeah okay. but we originally were Cargo Apparel and Merchandise because we used to do a lot of custom merch as well back in the day when I was it. talking about when we used to do the bespoke product. So example for L'Oreal, we, we used to make all their gift bags and all of their kind of swag product. And then when we started Cargo Crew, we thought that this little apron range would be just a bit of a side offering. And then over the years, like probably within three years, it became the more dominant revenue stream for the business and the online business just continued to expand. And so, yeah, the servicing of, of building out that capability to service there. So a lot of people obviously buy online, but what also happens is online is how we've attracted all of the customers over the years. Sure. Like it's been very much organic. more- Very organic. Very organic. I mean, obviously we've always, always had SEO and Google sure. and all of the paid social strategies, but over the years, it has been our main channel, has been our website. And then the servicing that happens offline has been something we've continued to build. 
So that's something that I think it's almost like an agency style offering when you're dealing with customers and corporates and businesses. They expect that same kind of service. And I think from day one with my sister being in um, advertising background, we've kind of really in, ingrained that into how we service our customers. And I think generally, like we really attract businesses and individuals who really want to invest in their staff you know, everyone knows that people are your biggest asset in business, right? Not everybody knows that, but they should. <laughs> Shockingly. Well, they, they should, should. Because yeah. <laughs> like, you know, they're at the forefront. They're representing your business. They're representing your brand. Of course. And I think at the end of the day for us, there's a couple of parts to it. It's like if people work in feel good, they're going to be like in the right mode for delivering good service, which is going to deliver good customer experiences. Yeah. And they're going to be memorable. And all of those things, they all add up to the ultimate experience for the customer who then comes back. Yeah. I'll give you a story, a quick story. Yeah, so we, we sure. have a Mart in Mar Vista and we brought in a new GM from Whole Foods. And the first thing he did right. was immediately put everyone in aprons, everyone uh -huh. that works at the whole front of house staff. So identity. it's like a Mart with food. Great. And before that, there wasn't any identity. And right. all of a sudden it's like, you know, I'm, I'm sharing the story so people sort of think about it because it, yeah. it feels so simple. But what yeah. happened to the customer experience is now the yeah. customer knew yeah. if they needed something, whether it was yeah. a, another drink or a spoon or a yeah. napkin, they knew exactly who to ask. Yeah. And exactly. all of a sudden it was basically like the people with the aprons are the experts. And yeah. so if I, if I see a product but I've never tried it, mm. who do I ask? Well, let me of find course. someone with an apron. Yeah. And then I say, hey, what is this offering here? Totally. And it, it was incredible. And like sales went up. Yeah. And it's, so it's like such a little thing, but yeah. I'm saying it because, it, you know, it sounds nebulous, but as someone who just witnessed it mm. in real time, yeah. it changed the entire feel yeah. of a space Absolutely. and it translated to revenue. And it's such a simple thing. It is. In and theory. If you, if you actually think about the apron, even forgetting all the other uniform pieces that we do, as an entry price and an entry product, right. it's very affordable. And it has, a, it has so many jobs, like exactly what you described. It's like the humble apron can do all of that. Yeah. It can unite people so that they're easily identified for customers. It protects clothing. It has those practical and functional purposes of what it was built for, yeah. but it does so much more, like exactly what you were saying. It's like this kind of touch point, this visual kind of like, okay, that memory of what people associate with their experience. And it's so frustrating when you're in a really busy venue or even in a retail store and you can't find the staff. Okay. Like if you can't find the staff, you're like, where are they? If you can't identify them, it's so frustrating, particularly when you're in a hurry. So yeah. like for me, starting with an apron is the best way for businesses just to kind of Everyone feels uniform. Everyone feels united. Yeah. And it also, it's very inclusive. An apron looks good on everyone. So it's like such a simple way to really kind of like create that magic within a brand or a, or a venue. So I completely, I support exactly what you're saying, obviously, but I've seen that as well. I want to do this thought exercise. So here we are. We're going to open up a sports bar. Yeah. In my head, you know, I thought, okay, cool. We're going to put all the staff. We're going to let them choose like a jersey that yeah. represents their hometown. Cool. And then a part of sports is memorabilia. And so we can yeah. have, like, we can make custom patches for yep. the people who were there on day one. Yep. And then every year yep. or every like big game, we give patches and the people just add the patches to yeah. the jersey. Then at some point I was like, well, that means everyone's going to have a different jersey. Mm. And if it's a game day, maybe they, the jersey just gets lost because in theory, like if, if let's say I'm, you know, from Massachusetts and I have a Boston Celtics right. jersey on and the Celtics are on anyone i guess in theory could look like they work there yeah right, right? that's and so, true and so then it's like okay well that's probably not a good idea from your perspective mm. you know here you are wearing this green which is yeah. going to be our color and so to me it's like this feels perfect yeah um how do you help brands restaurants hospitality groups think about this yeah. and then here i am a complete novice right like yeah. like really i just told yeah. you the apron story that should yeah. give you a sense of where i am on the no, journey it's, it's of good but I'm learning. And so in, yeah. in like, what, what else would you do yeah. besides sort of what you're wearing? What other things are there? Ah, well, I think, well, first of all, as far as how we service our customers, we would want to understand from them, what is the venue? What's okay. the vision of the, of the venue? What is the experience that, that the customer's wanting to deliver? Mm -hmm. And then what you would do is you would really put forward and curate the right pieces that are going to deliver that experience. So for example, if it was a fine dining restaurant, you, you're going to go for something really chic you know, a button button down white shirt, you know, maybe a full tonal like white apron. And then you might have, you know, the host wearing a black dress. And so it's really about like we and we do all of those pieces. So what I was saying before was even like, dresses like absolutely. A, wow. Yeah. That's also the ongoing evolution of our brand. So I feel like what 
our approach has always been we've got a foundation of staple styles that transfer a lot through different businesses. So say, for example, besides the apron, we're very strong in, say, our Oxford shirt collection. And if you think about an Oxford shirt, it's such a great staple product that's going to work for men and women yeah. and it looks great under an apron but you can also wear it you know with a blazer over it and it can become a hotel uniform and then you have this you could have this one piece that say we do an Oxford shirt in an oatmeal colour and if that was worn with a navy blazer but then for you know for hospitality within the hotel or the you know they, they could be wearing a navy apron with the oatmeal so it's like how do you kind of put together those building blocks of a look that's going to look united but have the right pieces for the different roles. So you do that. You guys do Absolutely. that. The designer yeah. sort of interest. Yeah. And so then, almost like a brand identity via yeah. fashion. And yeah. you guys help curate yeah. that based on, I assume, renderings, drawings, yeah. a brand book, yep. color scheme. Absolutely. And that's, you know, but oh, what we try hired. and do, that's amazing. what we try and do though, is we try and point our customers to the existing range that's available from stock. So they don't have to go down the customer route. We do do custom programs, but when I was just giving the example of the Oxford shirt and the blazer and the apron, they're all stock products. So we hold them in stock. There's no minimums for our customers. So the only minimums we have is if they do embroidery, it's like a six unit minimum because the machines have six heads, but it's all about delivering that convenience to our customers through uniform curation. So I think where the skill and the kind of design element comes in is it's all of our experience over the years of continuing to build out what are the new products that our customers need so that we can continue to dress, as I was saying earlier, front of house, back of house, managers, and have those different like layers of a uniform, yeah. but still ensuring that within our collection, it looks coordinated and united. And then there's so many ways we can then customize that level up for a customer, say a handkerchief, a tie, embroidery, apron straps. So we kind of offer like little, like interesting customization elements that yeah. um, are easy for customers. They're not expensive and there's usually minimums and not too bad. So we, I just think it's about being innovative. I think these days you want to keep it simple for your customers. That's our job because, yeah. you know, uniforms actually are not easy. People think, oh, you know, that must be easy. You just sell uniforms. But God, no. it's an emotive product. People, I'm in it right now. And I, I think it's, it's like you can choose anything. Yeah, and exactly. So in that you have a limited. Yeah. Right. There's so many options. Yeah, exactly. How do you choose correctly? That's and, hard. Well, what you need to think about is what does replenishment look like? So what you said before about, say, if you wanted to decide to do, you know, different jerseys and things, a concept might work at the start. But what happens is the day to day gets in the way and then you start to get busy and then you have people that change staff and then and then it's like, how do you keep everybody looking consistent? So I feel like that pre-work and that kind of pre-thinking about whatever you choose as a business for a uniform, you need to think about the ongoing servicing of that. How does it become easy for you and for the business? You're running a business, you're running a venue, you've got a million things to do. Yeah, the last thing you want to be thinking about is uniform. How many and uniforms do people order per employee? Um, it really depends, but on average, if they're a full-time employee, it would be between two to three outfits for a week. And then for casual, it tends just to be like one, one or two. And is there a secret to the fabric in terms of like... Absolutely. Okay, so what oh. is the fabric? Because I can imagine it can get pretty dirty pretty quick. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is absolutely part of, I suppose, where my design background comes in. The team that we've built have all kind of come from industry. And as it relates to our fabrics, we are so particular about the fabrics that we use. And we make all of our fabrics ourselves. So basically over the years, we're continuing... You make it yourself. Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah, so we specify the fabrics. We develop them with our mills we have them all tested and we wear trial fabrics before we put them into the range because it's not like fashion where you go yeah what oh, are you i'm testing just gonna launch something it's basically like you want something that's going to be cleaned yeah. or be able to be cleaned quickly. Correct. But also when we bring our product into our range, it stays there for many years. Like it's not like it's a fashion item where it's just in and out over the next few months. Like so the, the commitment to the quality and the durability of the fabric, it really starts with fabric for, from a uniform perspective because that is what is going to have to survive. And then it's like how do you bring the design elements and make sure that it's comfortable and functional all in one. But I think what's, you know, what's really unique about what we do, it's like – we know what works, but we're always continuing to innovate. We're very driven to continue to look at sustainability, how we can make our fabrics more sustainable. So as an example, over the past 12 months, we have transferred all of our virgin polyester to recycled polyester in our aprons. So what that means is now every apron that has polyester in it is made from at least four recycled plastic bottles. So we're really wanting to ensure that the product that we put out there 
has the environmental impact that we want to be able to continue into the future of reducing our impact as a business. And then we also have like full certification for our shirts and aprons for a standard called Okio Tech 100. It's like the global standard for no harmful dyes and chemicals in the fabrics. Mm -hmm. And to get that certification, you have to have every single thing of the product tested, threads, labels, um, yarns. And so they're the things that we're doing and continuing to do to improve our product. So it's just for us, it's just not, not set and forget. And I feel like as a business of tomorrow, if you want to be a business of tomorrow, you have to continue to ensure your product is as clean as possible, that you're continuing to you know, iterate how you're putting a product out there. But ultimately as a uniform, your uniforms should be durable, but we also want them to last as long as possible because that's the sustainability piece for us as well. So I guess back to the previous point that we spoke about earlier around, you know, we're not the $10 throwaway apron and we don't want to be. We yeah. don't want to be in How that promotional. How much is an apron? What's, or what's the price well, range? Well, the price starts at like thirty nine ninety nine, dollars okay. or oh, actually for a waist apron, even cheaper, like twenty four ninety nine. I think is the cheapest. That's reasonable. It's, it's really reasonable. And then uh, the range goes How up to How much is that about, what you're wearing right there? The custom, um, I don't even know how to describe it. These are one sixty nine. One sixty nine ninety nine. And what's the material? What's the so this is a cotton elastane stretch, super comfortable. And so what we do with these, these are garment dyed, which gives it kind of like this almost denim look. So so what we can do as well for a piece like this, we could customize a bright pink if you know if there was a brand that sure. wanted to wear that. Um, and <laughs> you know, Secret. so it's really fun. It's such a fun the all in one, one and all done approach to uniforms. Very inclusive size wise, so comfortable. We've had a lot of people here in LA going. Like last night we did this dinner and there was a personal chef that was there and she actually grabbed one of the boiler suits that we had on display and she went to the bathroom and put it on and came back in and paraded it. And she's like, this is my new uniform. And I think that's what's really interesting as well about what we're doing because obviously our key market is B2B and, you know, we love servicing businesses and um, expanding our network of all the amazing brands that we're dressing. But then there's also this crossover between business and individuals and it's like this That's kind true. of like... The individual's your ultimate sort of consumer. Exactly. Yeah. And, and a lot of the customers that we service online, even like home cooks for our aprons, and we personalize them with names, like, you know, like the, this name that I've got here. And I think what's really great about that is even if you look back a little bit into history and the impact of clothing and that identity that clothing can bring... I feel like if you're a creative, if you're a if you're a baker, you have a baking business or you know a florist, a home chef who's you want to show up in a professional sense but also in a way that kind of represents your creative difference. And I feel like within our designs and our workwear we're doing that and we're crossing over into that as well. And yeah, I saw that in action last night, which was really exciting. But, you know, I think about back in the day, like Picasso, he wore a striped long sleeve t-shirt, like people recognize him for that uniform. Yeah. And so I think there's so much power in how you show up, right? Visually. So whether you're a business, whether you're an individual, yeah. and I guess we're kind of so passionate about that, that it's like, there's a lot of fun to be had as well with our brand. Of course. Like you this know? jacket I'm wearing, this is what I call the Nick knows this, the developer jacket. Right. And so when I'm wearing this jacket this is your uniform. it means there's you're a in the mode i'm in the developer mode yeah. or i'm meeting city officials yeah there's something happening on the development side where yeah the jacket will match the audience and so then yeah. they know like oh he must be the developer 100 percent. really interesting exactly Whereas, like, if chef had this jacket on yeah. i would be like you look confused yeah where exactly. are you going you've never wore a sports coat 100 but if he wears what you're wearing which he does when he yeah. makes these videos yeah it's interesting <laughs> yeah absolutely i want to ask you this question because i'm fascinated so 2010 yeah you launch online. it the social media world is so different then. And so to me, from mm. a marketing perspective, you're sort of not a niche product, but a really specific project that people will sort of search, whether it's Google mm. or whether it's word of mouth. It's a simple product. Today, mm. in the landscape of social media, it's busy. It's busy, mm. but it's also pretty amazing because for the first mm. time, like you're saying, a baker or someone with some yeah. sort of following mm. can not only mm. look the part, mm. but in some way give you mm your brand, your company, yep. sort of this amazing window into yep. like, oh my goodness, I yep. had never considered, yep. you know, ordering yep. or customizing yeah. exactly what I'm wearing, my yep. uniform for my staff. And so it's I almost so. like, the way I think about it is from a marketing perspective, you now all of a sudden have exponential scale because yeah. every restaurant yeah. requires digital yeah. marketing. Yeah. Every hotel, yeah. you name it. Yeah. And so the whole hospitality industry 
at some point could just collaborate with you mm. on social media yeah. in a really unique way. Yeah, absolutely. Like never before. Yeah, Because right? on your website, they go on your website, they're going to see, sure, some marketing stuff, but yeah. for the, you're also showing your products. Of course. And to some, I hate to use the word generic, but to yeah. some extent, they can't be yeah. specialized because your customer yeah. is, needs some genericness. Yeah. But on Instagram yeah. or TikTok, it can be pretty Collaboration, amazing. Collaboration, absolutely. Right? What has that been like for you to sort of navigate? Well, I guess it's been a journey, like as you say, social media, like back in the day, it was like just posting the images and kind of getting the interaction. And now it's just, it's just the full halo effect. It's the full halo effect of everything. It's, you know, as you said, it's that community building. It's that really genuine community. It, it gives you that the platform right. to really genuinely build a brand through collaboration, through, you know, that kind of like, we approach that exactly like that as far as the more creative um, people that we dress in the space, they're often the influential voices within the industry. So it's often the smaller players who would then potentially influence a larger hotel as to how their staff should be dressing. So from that kind of like, I don't necessarily like the word influencer, yeah. but I feel like it's the influential voices within the community. What are they doing? Who are the people that are doing really interesting things that we can work with? Yeah. And we're always looking to do that. And we've done some really interesting things. Like over the years, you know, the people that have found us online have been incredible. Like we had around 10 years ago now, Goop found us online. Yeah. And they were like, um, they were doing a, an event pop-up in New York and they purchased our aprons for the staff to wear. And then I remember we saw it on Instagram and then afterwards we messaged them and said, can't believe that you guys wore our aprons. And they replied and said, oh, Gwyneth loved the apron so much. She wants to wear one at an event we're doing next week in New York. Can you send some more? And we're like, yes. Yeah. So we've got this iconic photo of Gwyneth Paltrow wearing our apron. And you just think about like the world now, and that was, yeah, 10 years ago, but just the, the opportunity to collaborate with incredible identities because who have an appreciation for design and to be able to be found, whether it's through social now or online, it's very, very powerful. And I think it's just continued over the years to build that opportunity. It's just like every day there's a new opportunity. And it's just like more so like how do you be discerning and decide who you're going to spend your time collaborating with? Because there's so many great options. And that's probably one of the bigger challenges. And I think for our business, because we do dress such a variety of businesses, what we like to do is we like to, to break it down into kind of product stories or product focuses and think about, okay, for the next three months, what are the key focuses of the product that we want to focus on? And then we tend to try and partner with different collaborators and things and do interesting things focusing on that because, yeah, it's so much opportunity out there. See, now the brain is going crazy. I was just thinking about the Masters, the golf event, right? Yeah. And so the caddies are wearing all white and they're sort of like this iconic uniform with people with his last name on the back. And yeah. Usually, you know, a caddy for the warm-up match will bring his girlfriend or wife. Yeah. And then the wife is looking like the coolest person yeah, ever. Yeah. And, you know, in not normal clothing. Like, it's not Correct. the Met Gala. Yeah. Like, she's just wearing yeah. sort of what you're wearing now. Yeah. But it looks yeah. cool and people yeah. really vibe with it. Like and then the they want to buy it. Yeah. They're like, this is so cool. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever thought about sporting events or just like not, I don't know, if there's like a non-traditional event, Wibbledon, something crazy like that, where you're, maybe you've been approached in a different light. Uh, We've definitely done some very interesting, not as much sport. I'll tell you about a very interesting approach we had a few years ago. But in Australia, we recently dressed the Melbourne Olympic Park precinct, which is where they have the Australian Open. So that was a full custom program. And the brief for that was Lux sport, Sportswear. So it was like we have like, you know, we did like really cool kind of spray jackets. They wanted the staff to be really identifiable because that's such a big precinct. There's different stadiums. And so I think for that, it was about bringing fashion, design to a sports look. But they didn't just want a polo. So it was about we did really cool puffer vests with like big Melbourne printing and different kind of quilting on the vest, the spray jackets, really big oversized outdoor jackets because it gets freezing cold in the stadiums at night. So like at the end of the day, we're a product business, we're a design business and we love product. Like we're very like capable of actually designing and producing anything, but it just so happens that our, our love and passion centers around uniforms. So how that translates really depends on the customer requirement. Outside of our existing cargo crew range, I feel like that is very specific as far as the full modern uniform offering. But, you know, adjacently we work with incredible 
organisations and also do full custom uniforms. So I think through our experience over the years, it's all about the fabric and then how do we listen to the customer? What are they looking for? We bring the fabric and the design. And that translates really to so many businesses. So it's super exciting in that way. But one of the really exciting projects that we did, it was just before COVID and we got an approach from Klaus Mayer's team. So Klaus Mayer was the, or is the co-founder of Noma in, um, in Denmark and obviously world famous restaurant. And he was opening a Nordic food hall at Grand Central Station in New York. And this was before COVID. So it was before it was kind of normal to have Teams calls and video calls all the time. And so at that time, you know, the people in New York who were setting it up for him, they found us online and they were like, we're talking to a few different vendors. Can you tell us more about your product? And I remember at the time we gave them a tour of our showroom on, on Skype at the time. We're like, this is our range. And, and so they were talking to a few different people. They were in New York. Klaus Mayer was in um, Denmark. We were in Australia. They ended up selecting us as the vendor for the project. And you think about just that kind of, we never met them in person, but we had the right offering that translated to this food hall experience of what they wanted. So, you know, we've had a lot of things like that happen where you go, we know that our look is quite trans, like transferable across countries. And, yeah. and that's why it's so exciting now that we're here in the US. Like I've been here this past week. We did our first trade show at in Chicago, which was the National Restaurant Association show. <laughs> NRA. Get your gun ready. Yeah. <laughs> National I'm Restaurant. Card carrying NRA member. Yeah. <laughs> and that has been so fabulous to not only meet existing customers, but the the three days that I was at the show, the amount of people that came up. I think our brand has that kind of happy element to it there's a fun element there's color there's like people just were like oh what are those aprons what's those boiler suits tell us about your business and I guess coming back to my earlier point about the American culture in generally having a great appreciation for workwear I mean obviously a lot of the customers that were at the show were in hospitality and they were either in restaurants or they were culinary schools or they were organizations supporting training and all of that for hospitality so many amazing customers that we spoke to but they just all had this appreciation for how they wanted their staff to look or how they want their business to show up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're doing. And to be able to now bring that to the US, I suppose, in a more formal way, we have been shipping to the US for many years sure. and we do that every day. But right now, the stage that we're in is we have people on the ground now. We have a sales team um, based here in LA. So it feels like people kind of, kind of say why is it taking you 22 years but we did get investment um, into the business last year congratulations thank you how much did you raise what kind of round was it um so this was the first round we did a uh, it was pe actually so pe purchased 51 nice yep. congratulations yeah. thank to you. you yeah so now Very we nice. have incredible like-minded partners who believe in what we've built as far as the foundation and so with them on board now our real next focus is to be on the ground here in the US look at getting some warehousing and expanding you know our customer base but even on the ground these last two days I've been in LA and I've been working with our VP of sales and I've been going to appointments Joey, and I, Joey you met Joey before <laughs> yeah. and I mean she knows everybody in LA I have to say she's an absolute legend but I've, it's been so fascinating going to the appointments with her and kind of understanding a lot of the product that people choose and like kind of gravitate to are the same styles as Australia anyway so there's just this very kind of like-mindedness of, of the design I think sure. the aesthetic but I think what's been really good is getting this direct feedback like it's when you're in the other country and you're just getting things via email and messages yeah. you're not living it and I feel like now my head is exploding. I'm going back to Australia tonight, so I'll be on the plane. And I feel like this past sure. week has just been like so inspiring. I'm so inspired about what we're going to be doing more with product to yeah. continue to build out the range of how we can service the local market here. But generally speaking, like most of the product is just so well received. And so it's just now getting it in the hands of the right people. So we've done a couple of like industry events over the last couple of nights, you know, working with a whole lot of chefs. We had a dinner at Stella restaurant here in LA and it just turned out that the chef was already wearing our chef shirt. They oh, had literally amazing. bought it online. On wow. And that was epic to yeah. think that we'd chosen that restaurant. It wasn't actually for any particular reason <laughs> that they were wearing Cargo Crew. And then they were wearing amazing. Cargo Crew because it was a great restaurant. For people listening that we can wrap on. So for people like me, let's say, who are opening up a restaurant or yeah. want to redo yeah. you know, two establishments that yeah. we already have. What's the process? We email you guys. Yep. And then is there a fee for the consultation on the design side? No. no, you don't no. charge for that. Wow. No. So basically the process is really driven by the customer about how much they want to be either 
hands off and just like service up from an, the online offering. We have all of our styles online. So it's very easy for customers like yourself to go, sure. okay, I'm looking for a shirt and an apron. The combinations that you can see online are endless. So, you know, it's really quite easy to self-service online. However, if if a customer is opening a new restaurant and they're like, okay, we really want some help here about how we can translate the design concepts and the food concepts to the uniform look, then emailing us, messaging us, Instagram, all the ways to move. Inviting message them us. on your podcast. That's yeah, exactly. Inviting <laughs> <laughs> them on your podcast. Um, and then we'll work with customers. They will most often share like a brand guideline yeah. or something. And then we'll put together a presentation and we'll say, this is what we think would work for you. And then this is how we could embroider the product. You know, having the embroidery in-house, we control the whole, the whole service of the, of the order. So basically we can control the, um, the quality of the embroidery. We help work out the best placement. And all of that can be done online. Yeah, we've got our service team in Australia, but we're servicing a lot of customers now in the US. So I think that's the best place to start if you're opening a new venue and you really want to have that kind of assistance in how do you curate that look. And, and I think because we work with so many customers, we get the insights as well as to how things can come together and yeah, being like, you that's know, right. people thinking differently. Yeah. yeah. What doesn't work. Yeah. What are exactly. bad ideas? What are great ideas? And we're very yeah. open about that. Like, you know, I feel like that's part of our offering is that we think, well, what's the environment? Is it a bakery? Is it this? Is it white um, dirt as opposed to like, which is what bakery is, which is flour right. as opposed to a wine and meat co or something. So I think we'll always want to find out those practical elements to be able to service the customer like really well. And do you know, don't you agree? It's so hard to get good service these days. Like, especially in you- Australia. <laughs> Cause there's no, just- <laughs> there's no tipping culture in Australia. So it's like, you could right. be waiting four years to get a beer. Honestly, you might as well just that, do it yourself. Is that honestly what you find? Cause you travel to Australia a bit. You so, said. Yeah. So it's really what I found because there's no tipping culture. And so what ends up happening is yeah. like, they're all making the same amount. You guys are yeah. You guys get paid great. I know, right? right. So you got a great livable wage, which is kudos yes, to the government. That's course. good for you guys. But yeah. the no tipping yeah. means that no one's incentivized to get yeah. Nick a beer yeah. in 30 seconds. That's the problem. And so, and you know, I think in a normal hospitality setting, most people are trained to say, oh, their cup is almost empty. Let right. me go see if they want to. They, and they don't even do that yeah, in Australia, yeah, yeah. which is just so shocking <laughs> to me. In America, which makes sense, it's like the, the people yeah. in hospitality or in general, people will follow the carrot. And so where yeah. do you place the carrot? Uh, generally here, I would say well-run establishments, you know, they can do really, really well with yeah. tips, yeah. like the tipping culture, Correct. specifically here in Los Angeles. Like you, can, you can make a lot of money at the right place as a waiter, yeah. waitress. We do still tip in <laughs> Australia, by the way. <laughs> you do? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, maybe that it's... was my problem. Maybe someone said don't tip and then they didn't <laughs> but give it's me not, any But it's not 100% mandatory like here. But I still think that at the good restaurants, most people still tip. Yeah. But it is a definitely a different tipping culture, as yeah. like what you said. And as you said, the wages are, are higher. It is a different, like having been here these past few days at restaurants and things, you know. Yeah, what is your take? Uh, well, the one thing that I find really fascinating is the valet service. I'm like, what? Like, well, there's no you, parking anywhere. So, no, yeah. I know. But it's like, it's the same in Melbourne in the city, obviously not to this degree, but you still have to go and find your own car park in a car park. Like you don't have someone do it for you. And I'm like, this is amazing that someone <laughs> would do it. <laughs> so, so you like it yeah the like the little things like that are, are really fun the places that do great valet mm. remember you in the car they won't even need your ticket and wow. so there are certain places here in la yeah that are right to that degree and yeah. that's sort of to go back to the service component yeah where that just that little thing yeah like blew me away yeah and as someone in the hospitality game yeah i immediately was like who's your manager yes please give me their business card yes i'm gonna have you run our valet once we're open amazing yeah because it blew me away yeah and it makes sense why do i have to hold the ticket yeah that's right right you should just yeah you, yeah make it easy the for price me. is the same whether my ticket you know what i mean it's yeah. the same price yeah. yeah absolutely it's about yeah make it easy for me make it easy for the customer right. and that's the approach with what we do it's like there's all those kind of pain points about purchasing the uniform, thinking about sizing, thinking about the minimum orders. I suppose from our, our size, you know, inventory offering as well, we have a really broad range of sizes so that we're very inclusive. And, you know, that's making it easy for the customer. So again, yeah. if people kind of go, oh, I might just go to Uniqlo and buy a few shirts, you're never going to be able to get all the sizes you need. You're right. never going to be able to get the same shirt again in three months' time when you have new staff starting, you know. So I feel like the service part, the convenience part of a uniform is very practical. And when you said to me before, like, what have I noticed here in LA? The one thing I have noticed is it's really like the energy within hospitality, the like it's buzzing, like places are so full and like, yeah. 
I feel like there's such an amazing dining culture here, yeah. such an appreciation of quality food. So I've really enjoyed it. And I also really enjoyed my time in Chicago as well. That was the first time I've been to Chicago. Another great food place. Beautiful. We went to Go on the Goat, which was amazing. Great spot. Um, That's Boca, the yeah, restaurant group. It yeah. was so good. So I haven't had a bad meal, I have to say. And so, yeah, I feel like it's very similar to Australia, but it's just everything's bigger. Everything's got that that bigger energy to it. So yeah, we just want to be kind of part right. of that. Well, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can get your services, where they can buy, where yeah, they can find your product. Yeah, they can find, find us very easily on online. So it's cargocrew.com is the website, um, obviously on all the social social platforms. Very easy. We're like on message as well on the website. So you can either email or do live chat. And like I said as well, just video calls as well. We're more than happy to do video calls with customers. And it's it's so good being able to do that these days because what you kind of want to communicate in an email that will take you forever to try and articulate to be able to do a half an hour call and to even just show online and have those conversations, understand the customer needs. It's all part of the of, of how we service. So yeah, they can find us online and hopefully start to see our product a lot more um, over here I'm in gonna the States. I'm going to try to, I'll do my best. You, you, we'll get you guys over here. Amazing. For at least three locations. Fantastic, can't uh, and wait. Counting. And look out for the Cargo Crew label on the apron so that you know, <laughs> once you know, you know, once right? You know, you once you know, you know. Yeah, thanks absolutely. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks so much. It was awesome. Thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, share with your friends, your family, or anyone you might think might benefit from the conversation we've had today. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more people who can benefit from our discussions. The best way to stay connected with us and get the latest updates on future episodes is through our social media channels. You can find us at Startup Storefront. We'll be back next Tuesday with another great episode. See you then.